spiritual warfare, the Christian concept of taking a stand against evil forces, studying the word, praying. Very good. Uh, the Christian concept of uh, engaging in the forces, standing against the forces of evil. Thank you very much. Uh, those who are coming in, all you folks have copies from last week. Anybody care to uh, discuss or, or bring any comments to the table regarding last week in the way of review? What do we come away with? Uh, we try to build a foundation for the next few weeks with this class. Anything that stuck out in your minds in particular? Uh, strategic plan. You know, one thing is the strategic, strategic plan in order to win the war. Thank you, Pardon, what was that? Strategic plan. Strategic, strategic plan. Strategic planning? Plan, yes. Okay, strategic planning. Does anyone care to uh, uh, expound on that? What is meant by strategic planning? What does that, or how does that relate to our the Christian concept of waging war against enemy forces? Well, we must focus on the enemy and come up with a way to win with the enemy. Okay, now when you say focus on the enemy, is that to give him in order to attention, or what does that mean? Somebody in want to help her out? In order to defeat him, or win. In order for to defeat him and win, we, we must what? We must pray, mm -hmm. we must plan, we must study the word, and recognize that we do have an enemy. Okay, but I want to go back and say focus on the enemy. I want to make it very clear as we go through this. Does that mean that we give uh, inordinate attention, or... Uh, Credibility to Satan? No. What does it mean? What does it mean when we say we focus on the enemy? Too late talk to him. know him and his, and his strategy. That's what I want to hear. Okay, so we can walk away with a firmer and more solid understanding of what we're supposed to be doing and what we're supposed to be about. Knowing the enemy or, or, or focusing on him, him or any other opponent for that matter, means that we, we learn as much about our opponents for the express purpose of being able to come up with a strategy that will enable us to experience victory over said enemy or enemy forces. In this case, our enemy Satan. Very good. Anything else? You have your notes? In warfare, there's always going to be pushback. In warfare, there's always going to be pushback. Someone, someone talk to me. What does that mean? Well, once you, I, I, once you declare who you are and, and sit with, um, with Christ, the enemy hears that and he's going to throw things in your way to push you away from Christ. So that if you declare, I am Christ's, he's going to come up with things to uh, make you go about face. Okay. All right. Okay, so pushback speaks specifically to opposition or, or resistance. I think if you want to take notes uh, and, and keep it in mind that resistance, Part of the Christian warfare means that we are to expect resistance. Can anybody tell me quickly what scriptures are, are critical as we launched this class last week? There also be some key scriptures that ought to just pop out right away. Uh, if not now, go ahead. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, what? 6, 12. Thank you, 12. Which says what? It talks about the principalities that we uh, come against. Okay, what's the scripture? Can someone help her out? What does the scripture say? Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the lies of the devil. For we do not wrestle with 
We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Okay, very good. All right, so we understand that we are in opposition. Uh, we stand against the wiles of the enemy of our soul, who is Satan. And we develop a strategy based on what we know not only about him, but more importantly, what else must we know? Who we are. Who we are. And what else? What else? Who God is. Who God is. Very good. What, what scripture also ought to come out that we studied last week? We talked about. Second Corinthians 10 and 4. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, but also 2 Timothy 2 15. Thank you very much. Um, study what? Study. That was the first thing I, I was after. If we're going to know our adversary, that's one thing that's of the utmost importance, but of equal, probably more importance, we ought to know who we are and whose we are. How do we do that? By studying. Paul wrote study. Wrote to Timothy. Study or be diligent in the uh, King, New King James. Study. Be diligent uh, in the study of God's Word. Alright? So that you may uh, prove yourself that you be workmen, that workmen that need not be or warriors, that need not be ashamed. Those who do what? Rightly divide the word of truth. Sound doctrine, sound teaching, not the newest fad of faith. Sound doctrine, okay? Uh, in 2 uh, Corinthians, Deacon uh, Mayfield, you said uh, Linda was uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. Uh, for the weapons, the weapons of our what? Warfare. So we see there's a preponderance of evidence that the Christian uh, lifestyle or, or is not a tiptoe through the tulips existence. It's warfare. <coughs> and Paul talks about it quite frequently. Uh, it's the weapons of our warfare. Notice he didn't say the weapons of our fellowship. <laughs> the weapons of our church service. Inclusive of it, but over and above all, we must understand that the weapons of this lifestyle, this lesson, this, the weapons of this commitment, are not carnal. What does carnal mean? Flesh. Carnal. They're not flesh. They're not of human origin. It's important that we get that. We're not fighting uh, people. We're not fighting human initiative. Uh, uh, please, we're going to move forward in about five minutes, but... Remember this, if nothing else, we are not fighting human initiative. Why do I bring that? No. Mm -hmm. So what? Because Satan may be uh, using a person, but we're not fighting against that person. We're fighting against his spirit. Mm -hmm. the spirit. Okay, again, Ephesians 6 says that. See how these scriptures connect, but we must study and understand mm -hmm. that we're not fighting uh, flesh and blood. So our weapons of our warfare cannot be designed or directed to be effective in fighting flesh. Problem with the body of Christ is that we're using weapons of warfare that are carnal. And we're not winning because we're, we're fighting flesh to flesh. How many of you heard the adage, fight fire with fire? This doesn't work in the spirit realm. Understand? That's why, that's why Jesus talks about loving one another, pray for them despite that despite when they use you and turn the other cheek and all those things is because that weaponry does not work when I go at standing human form. It only creates more fire. Okay? But rather, these weapons that we use are not flesh, they're not of human initiative, but are mighty through God. Through God, for what? The express Holy purpose God. of pulling down the stronghold. Okay? And what's a stronghold? Anything that has a hold of you pretty strongly. Okay? That's what we're going to get into. Anybody else? Anything else that's on your mind that you thought about in the course of the week? As we uh, wrap up review and move forward. One of the scriptures that um, I added to my list is Zechariah 4, 6, uh, the B part, which says, not by power, not by might, 
but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So we know that it's not us, but it's only by his spirit that we're going to have the victory. Mm -hmm. What was that scripture? Uh, Zechariah 4, 6b. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I asked last week, and I wanted to expound on that a little bit so you get some more clarity of uh, why I use some examples. We talked about what makes a successful general. We, we cited uh, uh, William Westmoreland, a great general during the Vietnam War, and uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about what makes a good general. Uh, so what else? Tell me, as I thought about it during the course of the week, what made those people good generals or outstanding generals or successful in their leadership? They were focused, they had a clear purpose and goal, and they wanted to live. They understood the mission. They understood the mission, remember. They understood the mission, they were clear in their objective, they were focused, but let's back up. And this is what, what, what I thought about as uh, during the course of the week, let's back up. Did they just arrive on the scene to become successful generals? No, they, they, they earned their stripes. They earned their stripes. Somebody, okay, that's very, very important. As you, you know, uh, during the course of my, my study, my preparation for the, for the upcoming week, I have a tendency to go back and forth and, and, and ping pong back and forth about what was said, what could have been said better or differently, what have you. I always do that as a practice, whether it's Sunday or during teaching or whatever, in my own head. And it occurred to me that we kind of jumped the ball. Because long before Westmoreland or Schwarzkopf was a successful general, five-star general, he was something else. Which was what? He was a He was a I said student. Who said student? He was a student. He was a follower. He was a, uh, he was a disciple. Okay? A private. He's a private. So again, his ascension to become a general and his ascension to become a successful general was preceded by being successful at whatever level he was at prior to his promotion. So as we're going, what's the point in all that? If we're going to be successful as warriors for Christ, we must understand that that, that we understand ranking, we understand we have a respect for rank and discipline and order, but we must be first successful uh, followers before we can expect to lead. And that's on every level, every stratum of life, whether you're a, a child at home, before you can be responsible, that keys to the house, you have to learn how to be responsible on that level. And then when you're able to demonstrate responsibility, you get more and you move up, etc., etc. Uh, so uh, leaders to that extent can be made, not necessarily born. Okay? That's just something that I thought of because all of us engaged in this warfare must understand that there's a starting place for all of us. There's a place of inclusion in the army for all of us, but at the same time, uh, we, 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 as we say, stay in our lane. We stay in our lane. We stay in our lane. We talked about foxhole buddies last week. Uh, and it, I must depend on you staying in your lane. If your lane is to watch in the midnight hour while I catch a few Z's, I'm, I have to depend on you that you're not going to take it upon yourself to leave me because you decided that what need to be done was more important than watching me while I rest for a few moments. It could mean my life. So that's why it's important that we, we learn the, the discipline, the value of discipline, self-restraint, self-control uh, for whatever facet of the warfare we find ourselves engaged, okay? How about we can just, just hold on to that as we move forward tonight. Does anybody have any other comments? Uh, Anything before we move on? Okay. You have your vocabulary words. Again, we'll be adding to them. Uh, but tonight, you want to take a look at page number three, I believe it is. The hand 
announcement tonight on dated June 22nd. We we'll begin with page number five, five, six, and seven for this evening. So as you collect them, you can keep some order in the days and they're numbered. So you can follow right along. If you missed the class, you can pick right up. But on page three of the first uh, handout, I'm going to show what we're going to do tonight. Hopefully we're going to contend with most of these items before creation. I will, battle lines, the garden, and the curse, and the revolution. That's on the bottom of page four, four I'm sorry. This mess going on in the midst of it. Anybody ever ask that question? Be honest. We just take it for granted that God said it, so somewhere in there, that means, in other words, that God may have been misinformed because Satan's looming around here somewhere, and obviously it wasn't all that good because Satan threw a monkey wrench in the plan. Oh, somebody, who said that? Who said that? He also gave, also gave us free will. We, we, you, you, you all the way down the exit level on the turnpike. <laughs> We're going to get there, though. If you look at your, uh, the top, top of the page, a couple things for consideration. And again, you're getting some theology here and some basic doctrine. It's, it's very important that, again, I build this foundation so as we connect the dots, you can understand this thing called spiritual warfare. But you got to understand it from its rudiments, why, how, again, we're always saying who, what, when, where, how, and why. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1 one, one, and 1-2, one, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and, and the darkness hovered over the face of the deep. Isn't that what it says? Okay. Take a look down here, though. There are various theories, and the, the theory that, that I ascribe to, the theory that we studied um, when we began our training in basic doctrine, the one I hold to is the one in bold. But there's one theory called the day-age theory, and for lack of time, you really inquisitive, you look that up and see what it, what it means. We all know the Big Bang Theory that there's a belief that there was this cataclysmic expo explosion and the law of thermodynamics and all this and boom and everything was here. That's one theory. But what I want to really give us um, for tonight and for our understanding where pastor believes and where pastor is coming from and what I teach is, is the most plausible uh, of explanations of what's called the gap theory, G-A-P, gap. The gap theory is really what we're talking about between verses 1 and verses 2. Mm -hmm. There's a belief that somewhere between verse 1 and first, verse 2 is when Satan began to show his true colors, which eventually caused what we call down below the ruin reconstruction theory. So gap theory and ruin reconstruction theory it's uh, purported that between verses 1 and 2, verse 1 there was this, in the beginning God created, but nowhere in there, there was this, this, this uh, revolution by uh, Lucifer, and in the process, because God who says he can't look on sin, God who said later on everything that he made was good and very good, somewhere in there, there was a ruination of what he began and a reconstruction so by the time you get to verse 2, what you see is a, a new beginning, if you will. I see some people looking at me, never heard it before. 20 years ago, I didn't either. But again, with all these studies, the one that seems to be most plausible is that. Otherwise, God would be in error by saying it was good. It was good after he, you, you had the, the, the overthrow and he starts all over again. So we had the, anybody any questions about that? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, these theories, are they biblically based? 
They're, they're biblically based, um, based on uh, several things. I base mine solely on the fact that, again, you, you had something that was good that had to be, there had to be an explanation for why and how you have this, this whole thing called sin and evil. Because God not a creator, he doesn't, while he created angelic beings, he did not create sin per se. Okay? So something had to have happened to cause this shift to cause a reconstruction. And that's the essence of the gap theory. Okay? And theologians argue it back and forth, you know, so it's not, again, this is what I, I believe, this is what I bought into as I study. Um, because all of these other theories, they, they have their pluses and minuses. By the way, if you were to get uh, Charles Ryrie's book, Basic Theology, you see it all laid out in there. And in each one of the theories, there are pros and cons. And again, the one that seems to be most plausible becomes this issue of this gap, this gap in between. And when something has to have happened that would cause a change in scenery that... Uh, would cause this reconstruction, if you will. Mm -hmm. But you said that the um, back theory was referring to uh, one and two, correct? So one, it was good, and then two, that's when sin was... In between there is when you have this, mm -hmm. this activity in the heavenly, if you will, where Lucifer decides that he wants to be like God. Okay. So... Verse 1, it was all good. Verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the heavens, God created the heavens and the earth. It's all right. there. And in this process, somewhere along the line, Satan, if you want to, want to answer the question, let me move down a little bit. Turn to, uh, and, and hold on to that because we will, it will become more clear as we move on. Because within it, you must understand the origin of sin. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. In these heavenlies that, and we're going to get deeper in this, we're talking about the various levels of heaven, you know, um, that's a little bit down the road. But in this heavenly, in this created order that God creates, and how many of you know that Lucifer was an angel? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was a created being, so that we can understand this whole... Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28, I believe we're talking about beginning around 11. Now, don't get confused. This is also what's called another theological term called the reference. You heard me refer to it before as the multiplication of double reference, but more clearly, more concisely, it is called the law of double reference. In other words, while Ezekiel is prophesying about the king of Tyre, at the same time there's a prophetic or spiritual utterance that that reverts to or refers to something else. Okay? It's called the law of double reference. Beginning in verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say, Thus saith the Lord. Of course, Ezekiel was a major prophet, and he's prophesying about this king. At the same time, uh, God is speaking about the plight of Lucifer who later become Satan. You were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Hmm? You were in Eden. And this is one of the ways you know that this is not speaking about the king of Tyre because the king of Tyre wasn't in Eden. Okay? He says you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. I'm going to stop right there because now we see his musical origin. Uh, we begin to touch on this. But you see Lucifer 
as a created being beautiful, highly adorned. Look at that. So again, in this law of double reference, I don't want you to be confused, but I hope you can see right there. The tip off is there that he says you were in Eden, in the garden. You were beautiful. And he's building a case because Lucifer created by God, given certain ranking in the heavenlies, was, was beautiful. He had order, he had responsibility, he had notoriety of the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Yeah? So now, if you ever hear, uh, because he was the chief musician, here, here, here it is. Uh, not only was he beautiful, but he was talented. He had everything going for him. All right? You were the anointed cherub who covered. Anybody know what a cherub was? Angelic being, but they had a specific task. Anybody know? Messenger. They were around the throne. They actually ministered around the throne of God. Yeah. The cherubs are actually at the, the gates in Eden. Uh, in Eden. They guarded the throne. Hmm? So Lucifer is beautiful. He has responsibility. He has musical talent. He was anointed. He was called by God to guard the very gates of Eden. When we sing the song, Holy, 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 and that part of cherubim and seraphim, cherubim is the plural of cherub. So cherubim and seraphim, seraphim is the fiery flying ones that we see in Isaiah 6. Cherubim and seraphim fall down before thee, which word in art evermore shall be there, cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. This who Lucifer is who Lucifer was. He was a cherub. Okay? Adorned, beautiful, talented, etc. Look at what it says. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the days you were created. Just stop right there. This is what God says about, not only in prophecy about his king, that he had human, relative human perfection, if you will, but more importantly for the purposes of this class, we understand the, 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 the essence of, or the genesis of warfare, you've got to understand the author of sin and what motivated him. So I'm just stopping right there for a minute so we can swallow all that. He said, you walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were what? Yes. Remember that. That he was created. But until what? <laughs> until iniquity was found in you. Okay? I just want to give that to you because now you see, you begin to see the, the, the beginnings and hope it's starting to come a little clearer because in this perfect environment, you have this perfect being who had everything going for him until it was discovered that there was a glitch in the system. <laughs> and that is the beginning of sin. That is the beginning of of why we struggle, that was the beginning of why that we, we contend with this thing called spiritual warfare. Yes. Excuse me. So the angels have free will. Angels have free will uh, to a degree. Um, when we start talking about free will, there's a little difference between the, the created free will that you may be uh, referring to and our human free will as people that are made in fashion in the image of God. Only because the only reason why I ask that because iniquity was found in his heart. He didn't. God didn't make that. No, God didn't make it. So how that you... goes back to why I, I ascribe to the uh, reconstruction issue. Because here's a flaw that's found. If you were, let's, uh, let's, say, let's say it this way. Uh, let's say you're building something and you find out that you build the room in, and something's off, it's out of square. You have every intention, you got the blueprint, you lay it out, you start building it, you get in and you go, wait, wait, something's off here. What are you going to do? Now, you didn't necessarily plan for it to be out of kilter, but now it's out of kilter. And you can't stand to live like that with it out of kilter, so what's your next move? Redo it. Redo it. 
reconstruction. Now, so, so, yeah, so the angels were were created within the first day. They were created. No, no, no. no you go back to day age, then you know. It, I just go in the beginning. In the beginning. Whatever was it a day or and that's why the day age theory is one of those things that people we theologians go back and forth. We talk about what's a day? Is it a twenty four hour period or what you know, so when you say it's a day, that's why I halted okay. you there. What do we what what do you call it a day? I didn't really mean that. I know true man, but I'm I mean, just saying so to help us to understand yeah, that. I meant in the in Genesis one. In the beginning you had God created the heavens and the earth. What we call it a day, a month, a week, hour and a half. And that's when the angels were created. This is when the angels were created. Okay. And the earth was without form and void. Nothing there. God created. In the beginning, God created. And these are one of the suppositions that we must really adhere to. And what helped me to grow in my theology is we have to have some presuppositions about some basic things. In the beginning. In the beginning of what? So it's just... Just the beginning of a period of time. In the, in the beginning it's when there was nothing. Time, but we're not sure what that period of time is. Right. There was nothing and then God created. And it goes it goes back to these are good questions. Don't 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 uh, have no problem with them. This is why atheists, why we have to be careful when we contend with atheists or other faith, because it comes down to sometimes we start getting into these things and if we don't know how to handle the conversation. We get twisted and tongue-tied, but at the end of the day, it comes down to a faith. In the beginning, there was nothing, and God created. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? He took nothing, and he made something. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, I don't want to get too, too far ahead, but if you look at Colossians, I believe it's chapter 1 and 15, uh, it talks about uh, Christ being part of that creation process. So again, Christ... God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, together with God the Father, were part of the created order, whether thrones or dominions. Matter of fact, let's turn to that so we can get some clarity and answer this question and move on. What was it again? Colossians chapter 1. Chapter 1, 15 or 16? 15 and 16. You there, Cheryl? You have that? I just have some reference to it, but I don't have it. Okay. Someone has it, please. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Hold it right there. The firstborn over what? All creation. There you go. So you talk about what scripture reference there are. There's, 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 that's one A. Go ahead. Christ is the firstborn over all creation. Come, go ahead. For by him, all things were created. By him who? Christ? Who is God in the flesh? By Him, who was there present? Um, as I said, it goes. We can ping pong back and forth with this doctrine all all night long. Because it takes us back to Genesis one twenty six, where He says, "Let us, let us, let us." So He did. By, go ahead. Uh, mm. For by Him, all things were created. All things, things were created. Things in heaven and on things earth. in heaven and earth. Bingo. Somebody, let's highlight that because there's your answer. By Him. In the beginning, when there was nothing, God with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit created, go ahead, buddy. Visible and invisible. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Mm -hmm. For he is before all things in him. Okay, that answers your question, do you Okay. Well, that's that's why that's again why we must know what the Word of God says so that we can we can give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Okay. So now with this whole creation thing going on, and back to your 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 other question about will, um, I would say that the angels obviously had a will. We'll see that because a certain amount went getting ahead of ourselves, went with uh, Lucifer at his uh, dethroning, if you will. So I guess you'd have to say that they had to have a certain amount of, of will. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14 to give some more light on that. Mm -hmm. What I'm just giving you now is a basis for the origin of sin, where did it come from, how did God deal with it, and what was created as a result of it. Isaiah 14? 
Isaiah chapter 14, yes. Isaiah 14. So again, part of this is what we talked about, the Reverend uh, Smith brought out, knowing our adversary. We must know uh, what this thing, what, what was this thing all about? What jumped off? It's what I call the, this is me. I've never seen this word. I think I've seen this word once in all my travels. I use it. It's legitimate. I call it the Luciferian spirit or the spirit of Lucifer, which will be detailed in here. Anytime you hear a person inordinately refer to I, 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 watch out. Watch out. Somewhere in there, and we're going to get to it, you'll see uh, the Luciferian spirit. Yes. Isn't that also called the Antichrist spirit? That spirit of Antichrist, that terminology as we get into later on in the New Testament, and eschatology. Mm -hmm. Yes, but when we start talking about future events, that's when it becomes more pronounced when she's talking about the spirit of Antichrist. Hold on to that because we're going to go back to why that terminology in our age is very critical as it has its genesis in what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. good, good comment. Isaiah 14. Uh, beginning with verse 12. Here it is. You want to link this to Ezekiel 28. How you are fallen from where? O oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. His name is, is, is described, the definition of his name is right there. Son of the morning. Uh, bright, uh, bright one. Okay? How you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nation. For you have said in your heart, there's further evidence of your, your answer or your, your comment, Mr. Stanley. You said in your heart, what was found in your heart was this. It's what we call in, 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 in uh, theology the five I wills. The five I wills, it, it spelled disaster for Lucifer, will spell disaster for us. We ought to do a check in our, in our spirit when we find ourselves ensconced in any one of these five I wills. Number one, I will ascend into heaven. Ascend means to do what? Rise up. Self-ascendancy, self-aggrandizement, self-exaltation, self-promotion, inordinate self-worth are all indications of a Luciferian spirit. He was kicked out and he says, you know what? Just for a minute, any, anybody ever been kicked out anywhere? Mm -hmm. you know, nope. Anybody been to a party and got kicked out? <laughs> kicked out of the club, and just, you know, you just acted some kind of way and you got kicked out. <laughs> Which means you did something you did do to get you put out. And your first reaction is, how dare they kick me out? I'm going back. Tony's down his head like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going, I ain't know. They're going to hear from me. Hmm? I'm going back to where I'm not wanted. I'm going back to where I did something to be put out, but I'm going back. Hmm? Number one. The moment we determine that we're going to ascend to a place from where we don't belong or where we've been dismissed from, problem. When we desire to be somewhere where we have no business, which is just kind of in general. When I decide I want to be the President of the United States, and I'm not equipped to do so, I'm in trouble. The minute a child decides that they're going to run the house, Bye. <laughs> Does this just get, make it real and practical? The minute you get out of your way, see, there it is again. The minute you decide you're going to get in a lane that you don't belong in, hmm? I'm going to stay at a hotel past your stay. <laughs> their building, their keys, their security. When you're supposed to check out 11, 
1059, you need to be gone. And you ain't talking about going back unless you pay for another day. I will ascend, okay? That's number one. I will, there's a second I will. I will exalt my what? Uh -huh. My throne. So now he has this, this vision of grandeur that he has a throne. Mm -hmm. Look at how despicable, look at how diabolical that this is. The third one. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I'm going to have people that I'm going to be over. I'm going to be over stuff. Hmm? Uh, I will ascend again. Twice he says, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. So his whole purpose is to ascend back to a place where he was, but he lost it. But he's determined to go back there, not the right way. Here, number five, highlight that, star this, here it is, he reveals himself, and the moment we determine that we employ too many I wills, we jump right into this last one. I will be like the most high. You talk about audacity? This is what was in his heart that got him kicked out. And this is what God saw and said, oh, no, this, this is not going to go. You've got to leave. And with that, he took others that had a will or bought into, as I say, drank the Kool-Aid mm -hmm. and went with Lucifer and they got out. Those angels we refer to as demons. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. So again, the argument is very real that, yep, yeah, they had a will and they determined where we go on with Lucifer. And he was going to be like. Or he's going to be above. He says he's going to be like. This is interesting that you ask that question. Make that comment. One of the key things that we want to remember when we talk about sin is that it duplicates or tries to mimic the real thing. Right. Anytime we have a sin issue, it comes down to trying to replicate what's right. It masquerade. It covers up. It disguises. That's the word I want. Sin disguises itself with a form of right or righteousness. So again, when you find yourself struggling against sin or even in your own lives or around you, understand something. Somewhere in there is a Luciferian spirit of I will. And somewhere in there is designed to exalt itself back to a place of notoriety or in a place where it doesn't belong, or more importantly, to imitate God. You're saying that, that we will have that in our hearts? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Bible says we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And what I'm trying to give you all this because as we move along and see the propensity for us to, if we're not saved, and even when we're saved, hold on because yes, absolutely. No, I understand that we have sin, but maybe it's just, you know, never Go ahead. You don't want to be God. Yeah, like I'm not, like, I don't you, you, think we are trying to, you know, exalt his throne and, you know, sit on the mount and all that kind of stuff, but it's just in our way, I guess. No, that's why we can, the truth of the matter is, that's exactly what the issue is. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know? Mm -hmm. Anything or anybody, again, hold on, we're moving back and forth, and that's okay. I want you to get this. You gotta get this. The name of the game just hold on a minute so I, can, so I can put this together for you. The name of this game is in the notes somewhere. Look at the bottom of the page. There it is. Sin is always designed to draw man away from true God worship and place focus on Satan worship. Okay? It doesn't mean that I'm going to sit on the throne literally. But if I determine 
to take God from his place, I essentially put myself in his place. That makes me guilty of sin, and that makes me idolatrous. That makes me want to be on, his, on the throne. That makes me go into a position out of my lane that I don't belong. Anybody get that? It was explained to me one time that God is in control of everything. He created everything. So whenever you try to control your own situation, control events, manipulate the way things are, you have a God complex. And you are trying to be God. So then that puts you in that same position of Satan trying to be like God because you're trying to control. Absolutely. We're going to go, like I said, hold on to all of these comments. That's why it's good as being taped. Because as, as profound as it is, and as much as it might be first time, second time you hear it, the truth of the matter is that's exactly it. Anything, because God says what? We'll go into Exodus in, was it, 20th chapter, when he lays out the Ten Commandments. First thing was he said. You ought to know this. Go back all the way back to Sunday school. Thou shalt have no, this is stuff we ought to know. How are we going to teach our kids this stuff that we don't know ourselves? God told Moses, tell them, thou shalt have no other God before me. The story doesn't change. So the minute I, I will, now I become God. I just decided to ascend to a place that I don't belong. That's idolatry. And the reason why I'm giving you, taking my time and giving you this basis, and the reason why I said I'm so deadly serious about this, just based on this conversation, we don't understand the depth of this thing. Where it originated or how we get duped into it. As well intended as I might be, the minute I decide that I know better than God, I'm playing God. And I'm guilty of idolatry. And I'm guilty of wanting to ascend to a throne or a seat that I don't belong to. Me. You, us. That's some real hard stuff to swallow. The God said, look, I'm the father. Again, you folks that have children. In my house, I'm the father. I got this. You, you, the day you, and you, and you, and you folks that have been there, you know what I'm talking about. The day you decide you, you know better than me. <laughs> Otherwise, stay in your lane. I ain't mad at you, but you, you, can't, you can't be bossing me too. And so with that, it's, it's a similar thing. The minute I decide to revolt against my parents, I'm usurping my authority. Have you ever heard that term? I'm usurping my authority and placing myself in a place that I have no business being. If that makes more sense, and in, in, this, in, in this goal, the minute I decide that God, you don't know what you're talking about, I know what I'm talking about, you don't know like I know, you sit this one out, I got this, I will be like the most high. And we don't hear that conversation in church, we don't hear it often, but we need to go back. And, and deal with this stuff because our problem comes from our ignorance, not understanding. Oh, and it's okay to say, ouch. Because even in studying, you go, oh. So by the time Solomon comes around and says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not in thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge yeah. Yeah. him. Because if I don't do that, I'm playing little G-O-D. And now I'm involved in idol worship. And that, my friends, is sin in its highest form, purest form, most base form, all the above. that help me answer your question a little bit more? Yes. Okay? So again, it, it, it's always, always. Now, uh, let, let me ask you this question so I can get myself together. So now you got the overthrow, the revolution first. Demons, the angels, now they have a name change. Lucifer has a name change. He's now called Satan. Does anybody know what, know what the, uh, Satan means? Please turn the page. You might to obstruct. Remember this as I ask you this question. His name fits his character or his MO. He's an opposer. Oppose what or who? Authority. Authority, specifically. God. God. Secondary, but again, I want us to learn to be specific. 
Because if we're going to explain this to, to, to our families or whomever the case may be, we have to be very clear and concise about what we say. We can be very well intended as Christians, but uh, again, you know, I'm very big on, on communication and proper verbiage because what you say is one thing, what you mean is something else, but those are not making it clear what, we ought to be, what we're really trying to say. Authority is one thing, opposing God to hold up. Satan's MO is to oppose God, period. The I wills tell you that. You kick me out, I'm going to oppose you. I'm coming back. I'm going to be like you. Notice he has a good sense enough to say I'm not going to beat you. Right. But I'm going to be like you. That's a tip off right there. Understand, beloved, that sometimes the sin that we fall in, we fall in because, not because it looks terrible. It's because it's made to look right. Hmm? Or else it wouldn't work. It's made to look like God. That's one of the things that I always cringe about when folk will move on. Folk would say, for example, uh, I've heard He's said so God, and it's supposed to legitimize the thing. It's supposed to be the real Mahuzla because you can do God in it. And, and, and I say that to say well intended, but if you're not careful, and if we agree that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, who can know it? We don't even know the depths of our debauchery. At the end of the day, I can make the scriptures say whatever I want to say. Because I'm feeling, I'm feeling this thing so strong, it's got to be God. And who's at the, who's at the root of it? The one that says, I will be like. So you begin to believe your own press, trying to, trying to, and Satan is trying to oppose what's legitimate, and he creates a false illusion of what's right. And we end up in sin. Oh, really, God? God said that? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's go down to Coleman's and get a tuxedo and go and do this thing. Find out five years later, oops, God wasn't nowhere, God was nowhere around. I'm this year, I'm living in the I'm the president of here. He wasn't around for that one. I will be like. Remember that, remember that. Remember, when I say going back to uh, what I was saying before, uh, Tanisha, uh, the personal inventory is we want to use, the, uh, among many other things, the five I wills as a barometer. Is this a self exaltation? Is this a self-promotion? Is this a self-aggrandizement? Is this inordinate self-worth worth at work? In the inventory. What's this all about? I wouldn't care if it was a PTA meeting or, or a church meeting or, or parent, parent, uh, child issues, whatever the case may be, work <laughs> issues. We are asked, whoa, what, what's that? Is, is, there, is there a Luciferian spirit? lurking somewhere in me that's causing me. And I'm not talking about questioning things. I'm not talking about healthy, natural questioning of things. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about to the point where you become obstinate and indifferent and deter determined <laughs> to not seek God and go your own way. There's a difference. I'm not saying be puppets and don't question things or don't, or don't challenge things. It's not what I'm saying. Please get it. Different. That's why we say God. Should, that's why God show the light of in, introspection on me. You know what the song says: "To see if there's anything not right in me." What's the motive? There it is. What's the motive? Is the motive that things go right at work, or is it the motive that I get promoted, or is it is the motive that things go right, or or is it the motive that I just have my way? And if it's going south, that means somewhere there, there's a spirit that's driving that. And that's why, again, we're talking about spiritual warfare, because as I said before, uh, sometimes we find that the enemy is in me. Mm -hmm. He's not the problem, I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. Myself. My way, my, my drive to have my will. 
I'm going to be here hard show if I got to wreck the whole door mechanism. I'm going to be in charge. Somebody going to hear me. At the root of that, trust me. If I got to poison everybody within five miles of me, guess what? I will. I will. I will. Quickly, quickly, so we can move on. Somebody tell me just the opposite of that, I will. I won't. I won't be the movie, but more <laughs> In the scriptures, what did Jesus say? Not. Not my will. Hmm? Not my will. Not my will. Thy will. There it is right there. If we want a real barometer, a real litmus test for where we are in God, God nevertheless, look, I, I, I'm not feeling this thing, but not I will or my will, but I defer to you. See? See the difference? I defer to you. I will know everything. You're in charge. I defer to you. Not my will. Nevertheless, not my will. I, I look, I like to not be whatever, but nevertheless, not my will. Not my ascendancy. Not my comfort. Not my ambition. Not my goal. Not my notoriety. Thy will. Okay? Any other questions? Any other? Uh, bottom of the page it says this it's always designed to draw a man away I got to ask the question uh, at the end of the day Satan's agenda is to do one thing two things <coughs> it's designed to draw a man away from God true God worship mm -hmm. and place the focus on him it's always against God. See his name showing up there as an opposer? Sin is always, and I'm talking about the author of sin, we're spending the time in this so you can understand the depth of this sin nature and why we must wage this war. It's always against God. Another barometer to find out where we stand as individuals. Is it against God? Yes or no? And sometimes we don't know, we don't know. But when we find out, then we have to fix some things. That's why, again, we must study to show ourselves approved unto. Okay? But anything that we desire or engage in that is against God, understand who's at the root of it. Period. Let me help you out. So by the time pastor, whoever, or whoever's behind it, whatever pulpit begins to hammer away at some stuff, don't get mad at him or her. Do your own inventory. Because at the end of the day, if it's against God, if what you're swole about, or they don't pull the covers off of you, if you swole about it, go and check, go and check the manual. It's against God. And, at the, and who's authoring it? Satan. Because his whole MO is to get you to go against God. Do you understand that? So we talked about the body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we do things to, to desecrate the temple. It's against God. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. That's just a fact. And we've got to embrace those things and go, oh my God. If, if we find us, whatever it is, if I overeat, eat, don't you know that your body is the temple of the living God? You keep on eating pork, you go stroke out of here. That's again, and God did not design you to leave up out of here like that, so that means it's against God, because it's against His. Turn to Psalm 51. I believe it's verse 4. got half an hour left. David is obviously in violation on several counts. 
But when Nathan approached him and uh, brought it to his attention that he was the one that uh, was being illustrated, David pens Psalm 51 in his act of contrition and repentance. Verse 4 says, I'm just paraphrasing, against thee, somebody read it. Against you, you only have my sin, and done what is evil in your sight. That's it right there, all right there. Anything that against God, or against God's order, just let me throw this out to you, that's one of the reasons why this whole issue of same-sex marriage is just turning into a nightmare. It's a, it doesn't matter. I mean, we can argue all night long about they were born that way and that, 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 and all that other stuff. I get that there are pieces to that, but at the end of the night, and I'm not a scientist nor a psychologist, but at the end of the day, if it's against God, it's just against God. Did everybody get that? Yes. He said in the beginning, you know, he made man for woman and woman for man. Mm -hmm. Anything other than that is against God. Yes. And there's, they talk about standing as Christians in opposition to enemy activity. We must make a stand. And I'm not saying that I'm, I, I dislike gays or whatever the case may be. But I tell you what, I cannot stand with what God stands against mm -hmm. and say I stand with God. Otherwise, I'm just as against God as the thing that is against God. Everybody get that? Yeah. Can't have it both ways, saints. That's why I say this is warfare. Put on the whole armor of God. You can't stand with what's against God and talk about I'm for God. Not be healthy. Only time I seen in war where, 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 where one soldier wore two, two uniforms, that was Hogan's Heroes, and that only lasted for a half an hour. <laughs> you, you're being serious. We cannot stand with God and be okay with what's against God. Hmm? Yeah. Does that mean they're revisionists or that they just don't know the word of God or just ignore it? Well, it could be, it, it could be a combination of things. Uh, just, you know, the term revisionist is one who takes history and revises it for their own, uh, in, with their own slant or their own bent. That's a revisionist. They, revive, or they, they revisit uh, an issue uh, and put their own twist to it. More often than not, it's a combination of ignorance, which is again why he says study to show yourselves approved. You can't stand up for what you don't know. That's why I'm taking my time and little baby steps with this, and I'm just watching your facial expressions to tell me I'm, on, I'm, going, I'm going in the right direction. Some of this stuff is just, yeah. Sometimes it's just straight up rebellion because now that iniquity has been found in our hearts. There's that Luciferian spirit. It, we, 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 and that, that, that's, that's the human condition. Again, we were born, the psalmist said, we were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity. None of us came here wanting to be that way, but that's just how it is because of Adam. That's just how it is. So we all have that propensity to cross the line because we were born into it. That's why we needed a savior. That's why we need, we're having this conversation because all of this is behind why I'm giving you from right there and not get stuck with Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2. When back, back, at the end of the day, this is what jumped off to cause us to have this conversation in 2016. <laughs> Something happened to cause this shift from what was perfect to what is now a mess. Hmm. Bottom line. We'll close the book on that. If you want to know what he said, that something happened at some point to create this, and this is why we have this. If you want to put it in a sentence. I'm just giving it to you from the rudiments. Sin just didn't, didn't, just, didn't, didn't just happen. And all of this is why we have to be ever so careful because now that same spirit has the ability to get a hold of us because of that. Now, for the next few minutes, uh, bottom of page five, we're going to go on. The enemy opposes listening. He's an opposer. 
He opposes an attempt to obstruct God's plan, his purpose, his program, and his people. His job is to oppose you. Buddy, understand that Satan's job, because he's an opposer of God and anything that God ordered, get this. You can be anointed to teach, preach, pastor, sing, jump hoops, usher, do a deacon, count money, whatever the case may be. You need to understand at the end of the day, Satan's job is to oppose you because he sees or has an idea of what it is that God has for you. And by any means necessary, he's going to do whatever he can to circumvent it. When he only has an idea, he doesn't have an idea. He doesn't have, he doesn't have full control, but he knows enough. Oh, by the way, for example, Job is a good example. What he does is going around, again, one of his terms is, or one of his titles is, he's an accuser of the brethren. Well, you, you, have you considered Joel? I bet you if you put that on her, I bet you she'll turn on her. But that's his conversation about us all the time. He has an idea that if I can get them into this, why? To oppose God. And in opposing God, oppose you. If you can oppose God, you can oppose the plans that God has for you. That's why we have to get inventory. Now God is able to take, some, take our oops and turn it into something glorious. But trust and believe, and all of us have them. But you need to understand that these oops come from God, from, rather, excuse me, Satan opposing God. Not nearly as much about us as we like to think. It is, but it isn't, if that makes sense. First and foremost, I want to give God a black eye. Go back to the eyewitness. Is it starting to get a little clear now? First and foremost, long before any of us was thought of, Satan said, I'm going to give God a black eye because he kicked me out of the club. <clears throat> so if I got to give him a black eye by muddying you, black eye. If I got to give him a black eye by getting you crossed up, black eye. If I can discredit, that's why we got to be careful because anything that he can do to discredit the plan of God, and we don't know what the plan of God is, we'll fall for the okie doke coming and going. Still comes back to study to show myself, God, what do you say about this, that, or the other? So if I don't know, I might just step in. Just, I, I might just step in, I don't know. If I don't sit down long enough to learn it, I might just fall prey to it. If I don't know the wiles of my adversary, I might just become a victim of it. Hmm? Last thing on this page, we're going to move forward fast to like the next 15 minutes. Here's something that's key. Sin will always recruit others in an attempt to promote the satanic agenda. I mean, you know, growing up, there was always this crew. You know, there was a fight. Mm -hmm. Fight, fight, fight. Mm -hmm. Everybody, it's just one point, everybody just go, you know, whatever it is. Let, let's, let's go to the, you, know, you can edit this, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's this store up on Mount Avenue in Springfield, you know. The parents let us go off the street and start hanging around with the guys. There was this store, Mount Variety. We didn't call it that back then, but Mount Variety over there by Rouse Meeting over there. We go in there, we found out that he could, Mike, and Mike was making hamburgers and grilled cheese and bacon, this, that, and the other. We found out that Mike turned his back. He looked the way, the, the way that the Hershey bars were situated, you know, why he was, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had it figured out. You go in there and ask for a burger while he got his back to the grill, uh, to, and looking at the grill, and you grabbed it. <laughs> I got many a Hershey bar. Till I got busted. 
And I learned early on. It wasn't my idea. I go in there every day. I wasn't thinking about it. But somebody told me, hey, man, you know what? You want a Hershey bar? Yeah. So sin will always recruit from others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sin is not a solo effort. It always, and I say that because what happened when Lucifer was kicked out, he took those demon, those, excuse me, those angels with him. They became demons. Turn the page and let's move on. Some of the characteristics of sin, not in any particular order, but I think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit gave it to me this way. Number one is rebellion. And again, I must caution you that when you see people, excuse me, or you encounter folks that appear to function or have these characteristics, <coughs> don't go calling them demons. <laughs> it's not a witch hunt. I'm very serious because it's, it's, we're, 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 it's easy for us to start labeling, pointing fingers. For example, a child might be rebellious because they're trying to understand. It doesn't make them a rebel. They, 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 they may appear to be rebellious, but really, the kids just trying to figure the thing out. And kids do that. They push the buttons because they're trying to figure it out. You know, so that doesn't necessarily mean that they are demonic. Okay? However, rebellion is one of the first ways to identify sin. Because again, what does Satan do? He rebelled, Lucifer do, he rebelled against God. First thing you want to check, when you have overt rebellion, and that's the word, where there's overt rebellion, there's, there is a seed of, or, 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 or some semblance of sin lurking somewhere. When you see, and when I say inordinate or overt, not talking about questioning and just, you know, pushing the envelope, trying to learn and grow. Again, against God. When you see something that rebels against God's order, watch it. God said, Thou hast shall, shall have no other gods before me. And Jay Z can't do no wrong. To the point where you're obsessed with Jay Z. The point where you talk like Jay Z. To the point where you won't pay your mortgage to go see Jay Z. You might ask yourself some questions. Number two, obstinacy. One of the, and these are these are things that get Christians. I'm giving you this because these are things that get us. When you are somebody tell me what obstinate means. That's rebellion, but, but it's, it's, it's a gross stubbornness that is, yes, rebellion. See how they go together? Somebody, does somebody hear the bell? I will. When you're obstinate, I don't care what you say, I will. I don't care what you do, I will or I won't. Again, go back to children. You ever see a kid when, you, when they just get to that, they, it's all over their face. They don't know how to front like we do. No, no. Kids, kids, it shows on their face when they're going to be obstinate. They just pout, they poke out their lips, and they, and they talk to the turn blue. Take that food out your mouth. And you couldn't pry it open. You start getting that, talking about opening up an alligator's mouth. <laughs> then you couldn't get that kid, no, oh, oh, your mouth. And so they turn, you can't. Obstinate. That's obstinate. Okay? Witchcraft. We're going to talk about that because witchcraft is, is more than Halloween. Mm -hmm. Witchcraft is an actual activity, saints. Before we got saved, many of us may have been victimized by the spirit of witchcraft. Got to tell you. Don't even realize it. Talk about generational curses. Again, in our ignorant stuff, we've done to play right into the spirit of witchcraft. Didn't even realize we were doing it. I remember in 74, graduating high school, I'm growing, I'm 18. The thing was the Italian horn. Remember anybody had one of them? The little, you know, that I found out later on. Oh, no. 
between that and walking around talking about I'm an Aries. <laughs> For real. Mm -hmm. You know, at the book, this is what Aries is. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, sure enough, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Not realizing what I'm doing is ascribing satanic activity on my life. That's why saints ought not, in 10 more minutes, I promise you, saints ought not be running around talking about I'm a Taurus. The Bible, again, what did you say? Show it to me in the scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 for starters. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, doesn't matter what day in the month or year you were born. You were born again. That's what it means to be born again. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's all right to be a new Christian, but I don't know, baby yet, even my granddaughter, she's two weeks old. She ain't the same as she was two weeks ago when she came out. And if she is, something wrong. And I will expect her to stumble and spit up and all that other stuff, but not when she's 40. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I'm serious. We got to look at, you know, I'm a new Christian. How long are you going to be a new Christian? How long are you going to hang out on ignorance street and expect somebody to buy that? No, you've been saved 18 years. You're supposed to be growing. All things are become new. We're pro Yes, please be patient with me. I get all that. <laughs> Because I need it too. But I can't be using that as a crutch. I ought to be better this year than I was last year. Mm -hmm. Amen. In God. Warts and everything else, I'm supposed to be better, ascribing to be better. Can't be telling me, well, you, you know, I'm just a man. Mm. Now I'm just slapping God in the face. When he says you're a new creature. Mm. So saints ought not be running around and talking about I'm a tallest. I'm a Pisces. Now you're a fool. I say because there, there's no place in Christ for that. There's no place in Christ. And I'll show you as we go into this class. You guys, please hang on with me. Before it's all over, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Those things are from the pit of hell. And again, mm -hmm. it's designed to oppose God. <laughs> well, what's wrong with it? I read this trial. It's just, it's just, that's the thing. He gives us the okie doke, making us think, what did he say? I'm going to be like God. Mm -hmm. So everything he throws at us is designed to get us to bite because he knows if it's too obvious, we're not going to go for it. Pastor, he kind of hard. I don't know if it take on that. I don't know about that. Well, you keep thinking that, but at the end of the day, that's why we're in, we're in the mess we're in. It's supposed to make you think that. You're supposed to walk away and go, there's nothing wrong with that. It ain't all that. That's why you even got to be careful what we listen. This whole thing about grace. It's getting muddied. It's getting polluted. It's getting distorted. Excuse my English, but it's getting prostituted. And saints are buying into it. Because so and so's on TV and they must know what they're talking about. Be careful. Study to show yourself the proof. Idolatry, there it is. What is idolatry? It's not worshiping a solely worshiping an inanimate object. Uh, again, I'll give you the scripture. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Inanimate, human, or otherwise. If I make my favorite athlete more than he ought or she ought to be, I'm an idolater. If I make my wife more than she ought to be, I'm an idolater. Why on that one, huh? Children. If I make my children more than they ought to be, I'm an idolater. Because now I put them in a seat where God's supposed to be. Yeah. See why this stuff has some long-term and short-term ramifications? 
Sometimes we don't even really realize what we're doing. We make our kids something that they ought not be, and then when they can't measure up, we want to kick mm -hmm. them off. Yeah, we want to kick them off the throne. Mm -hmm. But they got a bit of being there in the first place. Mm -hmm. You put them there. Mm -hmm. And when they can't fulfill the position, then we want to dethrone them. Unsettled anger. Jesus. Another word for that is wrath. Unsettled anger. I'm not talking about everybody gets angry. That's human. Unsettled anger is rage uncontrolled that nothing and nobody can do anything with you or about it. It's just you just totally off the hook out of control. Where do you think that comes from? That Luciferian spirit? I'm going back up there. I'm going to be just like him. He going to answer to me. He going to feel my breath. Don't raise your hand. Anybody ever been so angry that they go, they go, no, it was me. Mm -hmm. Time I get finished, they go, no, I was here. Mm -hmm. They go, feel, man, there ain't going to be no doubt about it. Time I get done with that so and so, ain't going to be no doubt in their mind. Then Mark Wright rolled up on this place. <laughs> Guilty. I'm just, you know, tell the truth, shame the devil, like I said. Call it straight up, you know. So I get out of here, do the inventory. Unsettled anger. The eyes turn red, the nose start flaring. My brother told me one that went. Well, I checked, I got checked on that. My brother said, man, you know, I don't know if you know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that. Tell <laughs> yeah. I said, get out of here. I, I never knew that. I, I know I can feel the heat in my eyes. Right? <laughs> really, I can feel it just climbing up. And I, and I learned how to control that. He said, man, man you know it's just <laughs> so, so now I'm back. <laughs> so I do be like this just in case, you know. <laughs> you know but when that happens, the next thing, <laughs> Unsettled anger. <laughs> Jealousy. Mm -hmm. What do you think was driving Lucifer? Mm -hmm. Jealousy. 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 Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be prideful about or to, to be said good about being jealous or envious. Mm -hmm. Because jealousy and envy are cousins or first cousins at that. Mm -hmm. And their whole thing is, I'm mad because I want what you got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if I know I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even if I do deserve it. Because at the end of the day, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. So Lucifer says, you know what? I got a problem. I'm jealous. I want your seat. Mm -hmm. And I envy the fact that everybody is worshiping you. Oh. So you see why Satan worship is so deep and so devious? Because it's driven by his jealousy and his envy to supplant God, oppose God, take attention off of God, and put it on him. But that's why we have to be very, very careful. What's it? And again, I use that scripture. What's in us? What's in us? Lord, show me me. <clears throat> Show me me. Do I have a tendency to be jealous and envious and I want what you got and I'll and I'll go I'll wreck it, I'll wreck the party because I look I want what I want what I want. Why should she get all the attention? Why should he be the favorite child? How come he get to preach all the time? Whatever it is, how come he got the promotion? Jealousy, envy. Those two are killers. Dissension. <coughs> Take 30 already. Dissension. That's when you, at any, at any cost, can't be in peace. Dissension. I'm going to stir up strife. <coughs> Watch it. When you... It, it, I'm going to stir up strife. <coughs> <coughs> I'm going to keep folks going. I'm going to keep stuff going. 
There ain't gonna be no peace. I'm gonna see through that. I'm gonna create dissension. That, those are some of the characters. There are many, many more, but those are some of the characteristics. Here's the, here's the character, the challenge for us. I already did ask, uh, laid out Isaiah 14, so we're moving along okay. The challenges for the believers are to avoid contamination. Avoid contamination. First lady start hacking last Tuesday. <laughs> I just put a ton of money into that old car of mine. So I couldn't go stay at Kenilworth Inn. <laughs> Tried to avoid contamination. Yeah, right. But I was broke. So now headache and that yeah, I don't know, you know, I just <coughs> blame it on her. Cause I couldn't avoid contamination. <laughs> 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 Tony's going, boy, he got, he's, he's, he got cuts. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, 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 just seriously, though, for, for you, you can't, the, the key is, there are times in our lives where we must be avoid. We ought to at least be prepared to ward it off. Hmm? Now, I, I couldn't leave, I couldn't go to the hospital with it and hope that, hope that my immune system is strong enough that I don't get what she got. In my humor, that's what I was getting at. Because we can't always avoid contamination. Mm. Or else we'd all be living in our houses, locked up in, in our bedroom. Mm. But it's, it's incumbent upon us as Christians to avoid. How can we quickly, how do we avoid contamination? Number one, I see it, see it right there? Keep in close contact with God. Mm. Uh, other thing is recognize the attack. You heard me say often times, it, it, so we ought to do inventory and say, what, what was that? Mm -hmm. And before we go blowing off or whatever the case may be, like, wait a minute, what, what just happened? Did anybody ever have that go on, something jump off and go, what, 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 did, what just happened? And if we don't do those things quickly enough, we can find ourselves giving in to satanic activity or influence. What was that? I mean, we might have disagreements, whatever the case may be, people have them, but wait a minute, what was that? That's when you go back and do the, what, 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 what was that? What was that driven by? And somewhere along the line, either on my part or the other person's part, or your part or the other person's part, somewhere along the line, Satan is pushing buttons. You need to know that. Hmm? Recognize the attack. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says that. Be sober. Be vigilant. Pay attention. Because your adversary, the opposer, he's stalking you. Going around, stalking you. Have you considered Tanisha? He's stalking you. Seeking who he may devour. That's his job. Be ready, be willing, and able uh, to stand against the anti-God, the anti-Christ. And we're going to end it up with this one as quickly as we can. Remember, you, you mentioned the anti-Christ. The spirit of anti-Christ, which we usually attribute to last day, or, um, last day uh, uh, or eschatological events, really has its genesis in what we're talking about. It's anti-Christ. But it began by being anti-God. Did I get that? The spirit of anti-Christ, and we talked about the, the, the 666 and the mark of the beast and, and whether the anti-Christ is already here, is he in Rome, is he the Pope, and da, 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 da. But, but really what's most important is understand that the spirit of anti-Christ began with this anti-opposed God spirit all the way back in the beginning. And this is why I'm giving it to you the way I'm giving it to you so that you can understand they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. It's just the baby grew up. Mm -hmm. How about we look at it that way? The baby grew up. 
What started out is that I'm going to go back up into heaven. I'm going to be like God. The baby grew up. And so now that baby surfaces as the spirit of anti-Christ. But because God and Christ are one, if he's against Christ, he might as well be against God. If he's against God, he's against Christ. And if he's against God, he's against Christ. He's against you and me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is why we have to be so very wary. May I, may I just for a couple of minutes, uh, so let's take this last page. I just want to share these things. We'll pick up with the battle lines next week. Page 7. Anybody have any questions? Any comments? All right. So we'll keep you pray for a whole bit in a minute. The tactics. The tactics is what we're going to get into the meat of uh, spiritual warfare. We're getting a little bit deeper. We're starting to launch out. Bear with me, but I need to give you this foundation. The tactics. Control. Manipulation. We'll talk about the Jezebel spirit. Be aware, saints, that one of the things that I've learned in this study is that that's the most, uh, I would say, pronounced, uh, the spirit that we are most somewhat familiar with. But understand there are more spirits that work in conjunction with the spirit of Jezebel. But it's a controlling, manipulation spirit. The spirit of fear. Sister Arlene mentioned it last week. We talked about that. Paul told Timothy, I've not given you the spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. Okay? Fearful spirit. To paranoid. Delusional. A fear of what? A fear of exposure. Let me just, 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 what, 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 we fear? what things drive us? What things mess us up that has the enemy uh, opposing God and opposing us? Think about it. The fear of exposure. I might get found out. God knows anyway. Fear of exposure. I might find, it might be, it might come out in the wash and I'm not all I say that I am. So I'm afraid of being exposed. That's a spirit. Because the Lord said, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. So what am I afraid of? I can't possibly be afraid of what's true. Because what's true, God already said, and he's not a liar. But what's true is only going to make me free. So why am I going to be afraid of the truth? Why am I going to be afraid of exposure if it's true and if it's going to free me? Retribution. Don't you dare tell anybody. If you do, I'm coming to get you. Yeah, I mean, folks are just in lockdown because they're afraid that the enemies will come get them. When the Bible tells me, what, what, who, who, who can I be afraid of? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Hmm? God be for me, who can be against me? I'm not afraid of retribution. Though I call a spade a spade, I'm not afraid of the fallout. Failure. They might laugh at me. How many folks, here, again, I'm not being funny, but uh, how many folks here might have asked you to do something in the cell? I can't do that. Afraid that you might fall. Afraid that you might not do it right. The enemy's gripping you, trying to tell you you can't do it. But my Bible tells me I can do all things through Christ. I might not do it like so and so and so and so, but I can do all things through Christ. Mm -hmm. Isolation. I can't stand up for Christ because then, then they'll sh everybody will shun me. They'll think there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Anger. Let's talk about that. That's one of the tactics. Various insecurities. Indifference or apathy. Along with control and manipulation, we're going to get into this uh, seduction. And I, 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 I want to end up with this one because this is important. We're going to talk about the music for a minute and we'll go on. Seduction. When we talk about this, the spirit of control and manipulation, 
along with the Jezebel spirit is the spirit of seduction. Now let me help you understand, that is not all what we think it is. There was a portion in the scripture in 1 Kings around chapter 20 where Jezebel, in fear for her life, painted herself and, and went to meet Jehu, who essentially had her executed. What we do is we run with that and think that the spirit of Jezebel is a, is a, a loose woman with, with red lipstick and, and you know, and, and high heels and fishnets and all of whatever we think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, really, that's what we tend to, oh, she old Jezebel because well, she, you know, she can wear nice clothes and she can work it. That don't make her Jezebel. Mm -hmm. Right? So again, this is the, this is the like God, how he counterfeits the truth. And we were around here in 2016 thinking that, ooh, she ain't number old Jezebel. That was a small portion of the Jezebel spirit and Sodom. A very small portion that we run with. And to say that to say this, seduction is not just a physical enticement. Hmm? It's not just sensual or physical, as I said. It's a perversion. If I can seduce Pat into walking away from God, see there? Mm -hmm. Understand that spirit? What's it designed to do? Against God. So if I can seduce her to believe a lie and begin to follow another ism, for lack of a better term, I just seduced her into believing that my ism is better than the ism she was dealing with. I seduced her into believing that Lori is nobody and Lori is nobody to be trusted. That's seduction. I pulled her in and pulled her away. So it's like the act of persuasion. The act and the art of persuasion. It can have it can have physical or sexual overtones, but what I'm leaving you with tonight is seduction. This is what you want to get. And you, you ever hear somebody say, "Well, he he was a Christian, but now he's a Muslim." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seduced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seduced. Got seduced into believing that, that that what I got over here is better than what you had over here. However, it shook out. Seduction. Seduced. Hmm? So I just give you that again, and we're wrapping it up now. Um, in my final statement, I want you to get this and go home with this because I've said it many times and I want to make it clear. <coughs> Going back to uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, uh, we talk about Lucifer and his anointing. One of the things that we must, must do is be very, very careful, be very, very prayerful about and for folks who are actively engaged in music ministry. Anybody want to know why? Anybody want to tell me why? Because Lucifer, like, he was the music minister, or he was involved in music. And he was and a chief he was, musician. Yeah, he was a chief and, musician. And, and he got the Satan. He ultimately became Satan. And what does that mean to us? He's, right. what, he's against whatever God is for. Number one, he is design, his design is to distort what God has created. Mm -hmm. Number two, he's designed to oppose that which who God created to exercise the gift of music. That might be you and me. Very, 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 very careful. We'll go into it some more next week, but I want you to get this. And more important than anything else, I think I gave it to you. If I didn't, write this down. Point of entry. Why it's so critical that musicians, I, I can go another 15 minutes, but I'm not going to. I grew up watching church folk since I was nine years old. It became normal procedure for me to watch. Task to get up, they preach, musicians go outside. Mm -hmm. Just about time for the invitation, and then they come back in. My whole life, I never thought anything about it. There's no way in the world you're going to be a spiritual dynamo walking out on the word. 
It's just not possible. Soon as the man would get up to preach, out they go, downstairs, have a cigarette, open it, and come roll back in like it was something, just, just like clockwork. I watched it all my life. I'm going, you know what? They can't possibly have a handle on what God is saying in the corporate body. They walk right out on the word. Point of entry. Know that the, the, the Achilles heel for the average musician is that very spirit. Because that's how he worked. He was a musician. He has his inroads into the musician. He, that doesn't mean that he's, he, he, he takes over. But he understand. Just like some people have uh, an aversion to colds or flu. Some people can be in the rain all day long and never bother them. Some people, they get one drop of water on their head and they got pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Again, you have to know what's in you. Mm -hmm. You've got to know what your potential is. Right. And I'm sorry, if it offends people, just be offended. It's one of the reasons why it took all my life to pick up a guitar. Because the music is in me. And I used to wonder, God, why won't you let me do what I want to do? It's all I want to do. I don't want to do nothing, anything else. And then it hit me. If I went in this thing all headlong like I wanted to, I wouldn't even know anything. But that would, that would be the point of entry where the enemy can come in. And God would not release me to even begin to endeavor into it until he knew that he could trust me. Easiest thing for me to do is pick up that door on bass rather than pick up the word. Easiest thing for me to do. Because it's just in me to do. And once I neglect the word of God, there's that point of entry. Mm -hmm. Do I understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about anybody else, I'm talking about me. So we've got to understand that we're going to engage in this warfare that the less, if I'm spending all my time, and you show me a musician, there are rarities, but you show me a musician that's really, really good, I'll show a musician that's got about this much word under his or her belt. Can't possibly, because their whole life is notes and harmonies and chords and this, that, and the other. Point of entry. We can pray that those who have an anointing, the same anointing that Lucifer had, does not find himself uh, inundated with the same spirit that Lucifer had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, so on the last page, on page seven, like where it has tactics and uh, the battle lines, mm -hmm. um, do you have any scripture references like you do on the previous pages for some of those um, tactics. The tactics, what were you talking about? Uh, on the top of page? Like on page six. On the top know, of the bottom. Uh, where you have control, manipulation, fear, exposure, retribution. Like I was wondering if you have scripture references for any of those. What well, we'll do this for the battle line. Yeah, we, we, I do. What I wanted to do, um, I did that by design. One, so that you might be proactive okay. and just do some digging for yourself also to give you a, a sketch of how moving forward okay. next week we'll go there okay, okay. however uh, just quickly uh, Isaiah 26 2 and 3 to keep you in perfect peace Does your mind is stayed on it and these are stable scriptures mm -hmm. Second Timothy 2 and it was 1 7 not giving you a spirit of fear but the power and love in the sound mind. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, anger was in Romans 12, the latter verses. Anger is, uh, uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Mm -hmm. So, so off the top of my head, again, this is an exercise you guys can do. He said, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Be angry, and sin not. So we can go on and on and on. Do not be, uh, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Okay, control. 
First Peter 5 and 8. Be sober, clear minded, vigilant, watchful. You cannot be sober and watchful and attentive and articulate if you're imbibed or if you're overindulged. And it doesn't necessarily mean alcohol. You can be drunk with yourself <laughs> and miss it. <laughs> No, no, really. Like I said, yeah. I'm, I'm going and saying some things and just putting some stuff out there, but we got it all twisted. You don't have to turn up a bottle a day in your life, but you could be a junkie alcoholic on you. Mm -hmm. So, think clearly. Got another scripture. But think more of yourself than you are. I don't know what that means right off the top of my head. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. There's a litany of them, but that's why I said that's an exercise that you guys can and should do. Be proactive. What does the Bible say about anger? What does the Bible say about wrath? What does the Bible say about insecurities? You know? What does the Bible say about this, that, and the other? You know, for those of you who have computers, there's a, there's a litany of information you can get um, from there. But we need, to, we need to make our way home. It's getting late. Um, any, anything else? Again, as far as I'm concerned, I can stay all night, but I know that you guys can get home and work in tomorrow, whatever the case may be. We'll pick up next week. We'll just delve into a little bit more. Anybody get a little clearer picture tonight? A little bit clearer? Okay. Again, don't, don't look at each other cross-eyed. Yeah. I knew he had a demon, though. <laughs> Uh, we can vilify folk, and I'm serious. We can crush a person. You know, we can crush a person. You know, no matter that issue, we all do. When we go labeling people, we can really wreck them, particularly if they're tender. Okay? All right. Let's bow our heads. Eternal God, we thank you for another night as we launch into this and put some meet on the skeleton, God. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you for the clarity of thought. Thank you, God, for giving us the boldness and the clarity and the wisdom to be able to expose the wiles of the enemy. Just that this rudimentary lesson into the beginnings of sin and how it affects us all these hundreds of years later. Bless us as we go home, study, and consider these vocabulary words and all that we're getting into. Just keep us together. Thank you for this crowd. As we go to the summer, thank you for the really want to learn. Thank you for wanting to learn. Help me to be uh, a student. Uh, not to be a student per se, but to make sure that folks know what's right. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right.